Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. A special welcome to our colleagues joining us across the region. My name is Kevin Finch, Assistant Manager of Research, and I'll be chairing this morning's proceedings. The discussion this morning focuses on the current financial stability issues in Trinidad and Tobago. It's an important discussion at this juncture for a few reasons. Firstly, as a central bank, it is our responsibility to be accountable to our stakeholders and to you, the general public, on our stewardship of the financial sector. Secondly, and perhaps of more relevance, the ongoing pandemic will have implications for the financial sector. And as such, this is an opportunity for us to share with you what are some of our plans to navigate the current conditions as well as for periods ahead. This morning, we have three speakers with us. Leading the line, Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Alvin Hillier. He will be followed by Mrs. Michelle Francis Panto, Deputy Inspector of Banks, Non-Banks and Payment System Oversight. And closing us off will be Mr. Patrick Solomon, Acting Inspector of Financial Institutions. Uh, before we begin, we'd just like to remind you of some of the guidelines for the webinar. We will present for approximately 30 minutes, after which time we will open the floor for questions. If you have a question, we ask that you use the raise hand icon, after which time you'll be acknowledged. And we kindly ask that you uh, put on your camera so that we can see you because we are recording the session. So at this point in time, we'd like to turn you over to Governor Hillier to start us off. Governor. Yes, thank you very much, Kevin, and welcome to all of our participants. We are happy that you could take the time to join us from wherever you are. We have quite a few participants. And um, this is the first time that, that we are doing this like this. We are, we are accustomed to having uh, a session on the 16th floor with cameras and all that. So given the current context, this is how we're doing it. And uh, we hope it works. So bear with us. And um, we are dealing with a very important topic today. My role in my, in my 10 minutes would really be introductory. Uh, after which I'll turn you over to, to our Deputy Inspector and Inspector for the main course. So with that um, in mind, let me get straight to the heart of the matter. And I want to start with um, our priorities. The Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago is currently in high alert mode when it comes to supervision of the financial sector. And let me repeat that. The Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago is currently in high alert mode when it comes to supervision of the financial sector. And why is this? What has changed? What is prompting our uh, focus now? Well, we look at history and we look at other experiences. In our history, if you look at the chart below, some things come out quite starkly. All our financial system main problems have been following domestic macroeconomic shocks, whether it was the, the oil shocks of the 70s, 80s, and then the global financial crisis. We see, if you look carefully, we had the problems with the indigenous financial institutions, financial banks. We had the non-bank financial institutions collapse. Then most recently, we had the problem with the insurance company. So we have a clear guideline as to what what history teaches us. Now, if you look at the right, you see, you see the, the icon of the virus. It is clear that we are in a very difficult situation that has macroeconomic impacts, and we need to be aware of this, and we need to, as they say, take in front before in front takes us. Now, if you look at the international experience, and we looked at um, a report by the CGB, you could go back to the first slide, please, the CGB and the IDB, I think this, this um, quote is quite apt. What it says is that the deep recession and the serious income losses for families and firms may provoke significant challenges for financial systems. Unlike recent financial or balance of payments crises, this may be more of a slow moving event in which credit risks take center stage. Good policies will be critical to navigate the coming months. Now this is not, they're not talking about Trinidad and Tobago, they're talking about worldwide and they're talking about Latin America in particular. So we are part of a scenario in which we need to be very careful. 
ultimately, the, the, the thing is that if prolonged, the pandemic could limit borrowers' capacity to repay and weaken financial institutions' balance sheets and asset quality. So this is why we are, we are very um, in, in high alert mode to be ready to deal with this situation. Now, let's go on to see how our domestic financial system is. Having said that we are in, in, in ready mode, we would indicate that our financial system is fundamentally healthy and sound. So if you look at any of our um, the traditional financial stability indicators, we rank very, very well. The banks uh, have a high capital adequacy ratio, much, much higher than the, the, um, the regulatory limit of 8 to 10 percent, depending on how you, how you count it. So this is very comfortable. Uh, Non-performing loans are still very small, about 3.5%. By any metric, this is quite, quite, um, quite small, but we have to be concerned about it. Return on equity and all of that. So the banks are profitable. The financial institution is going basically well. You have some little things that we need to sort out, but, but we're working on that. Even on the insurance sector, things are not, um, not bad at all. Pension funds are growing and so So we do, have, we do start from a strong base. Uh, but now, as we note, we had a major policy action recently where we reduced the reserve requirement and the repo rate. And so far, the response has been sluggish. Credit growth is sluggish. And why? We think it's both a demand and a supply factor. On the demand side, that individuals and businesses are not, are not anxious to indebt themselves more in the current climate because they don't know what the future will hold. And then on the supply side, the banks are also concerned about maintaining their credit quality. So let me go on to the vulnerabilities. Because although we pat ourselves on the back and say, well, you know, things are fine, we do recognize there are certain vulnerabilities. And, and the vulnerabilities I'm pointing out were expressed in our uh, financial stability report recently, a couple of um, weeks ago, I believe. So you, you could go through it uh, in detail at your leisure. I'm not going to, to, um, to, to recount all of that, but just to, to highlight the main points of vulnerability. One is rising house, household debt, which grew from about 10% of GDP since 2010. This is significant because people are indebting themselves more and more, and it's something we need to be, to be aware of, because if things uh, become fragile on their side, then they have this debt overhang to deal with. So it's something that, that we need to be aware of. The second is sovereign credit exposures. About one third of the financial system assets are public sector instruments. This is quite significant. So we need to be aware of that. Concentration in any particular uh, sector is, is a cause for, um, for review, careful review. Uh, so far, we have not seen what you call crowding out of private sector credit. But again, we need to be looking at that carefully. The demands of digitization. I don't have to say much about that because we all know that we are in a world where things are moving very quickly. Electronic transactions, people want to do all sorts of things. So we have to be aware of that and, and the dangers and risks posed by that, particularly cyber attacks. Growing interconnectedness, Trinidad and Tobago is at the center of a lot of action in the Caribbean and elsewhere. And, and so that we have to be aware of problems not only in our country, but in the rest of the world, in the region and so. So interconnectedness is important and plus it also makes it things very complicated. You know, the distinction between banks, non-banks and all this sort of thing. Susceptibility to shocks. As a small uh, twin island nation, we know about that. Hurricanes, I mean, Trinidad, people say God is a trinity, so we haven't been you know, hit hard by some some hurricanes, but still we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a difficult zone. We have energy prices, we are, we are um, focused on, on one main product. Now we have the global pandemic, climate change. So we need to be build our resilience to that. So therefore on the policy front, we need to do a couple of things and I'll just mention them because Patrick will get deeper into this. Advance the required legislation. A lot of things still need sorting out continue to develop a more risk-based approach to supervision. We are already there, but we need to, to continue because we don't have unlimited resources. So we have to focus on the right thing at the right time. 
modernize and extend safe electronic processes to all communities. That's, that is important. It's based on the, um, the digitization issue. Develop closer relationships with domestic and external regulators. Again, the interconnectedness bears this out. And strengthen the capacity to weather the inevitable shocks. So now let me go on to uh, where are we now and how are our um, thoughts organized. You would look or, or relook if you've done it before at our blueprint for continued financial stability, which we um, talked about, I think it was in last year, May or something. I can't remember the exact um, time period. So that, in a sense, sets out what we are, our priorities. And we had a, a long, um, nice session with the public on that. But it's on our website. You could see the, the actual um, report. You could see the, the, the um, PowerPoint presentation. You could see the, um, the YouTube video of everything. We have a strategic plan that governs our actions. And in that, our, again, that is on our website. And you would see the, the, the details there. And you will see exactly where we are because we updated it on Friday last. And then our financial stability reports, I talked about that, um, that we just think. So all our plans are nicely laid out there. Uh, the one thing that I'll introduce um, um, Michelle to talk to you about is our financial sector assessment program, which we talked about in our, our blueprint. And she will talk about that where the IMF World Bank came in and discuss these issues with, with um, Trinidad and Tobago. So with that, let me turn to, uh, to Michelle to talk about our financial sector assessment program. Hi, good morning to everyone, and thank you for taking the time to tune into this webinar. Um, as Governor mentioned, I will be speaking to you today on the key observations made from the FSAP assessment and the key recommendations to address the assess risks. Uh, the first, prior to the 2020 FSAP that was recently conducted and which spanned the period July 2019 to February 2020, the country would have had two previous FSAPs. One was conducted in 2005, which was a detailed assessment, and another was conducted in 2010, which was narrow in scope. The main observations from these previous FSAPs were that the credit, market, and liquidity risk were low in the banking sector, short-term fragilities were evident in the insurance sector, and that the supervisory, regulatory, and legislative deficiencies needed to be addressed in order to mitigate the financial risks. The 2020 FSAP assessment was detailed and looked at the effectiveness of the supervision of banks and non-banks, including financial conglomerates, developing macroprudential regimes, a policy regime, and strengthening the financial crisis management and resolution frameworks. A key focus of the 2020 FSAP was whether the regulatory framework was up to date with international best practices, uh, given the growing complexity and importance of Trinidad and Tobago's domestic system. The 2020 FSAP showed um, that the financial, observed, sorry, that the financial sector was successful in navigating the 2016-2018 um, economic slowdown. And the banking system, as Governor would have mentioned, the banking system was profitable, liquid, and well capitalized. Capital ratios averaged over 20%. And the insurance sector had weathered the challenges posed by climate related events in the region. Trinidad and Tobago had also taken significant steps to strengthen its AML CFT framework, such that the country was removed from the FATF list of countries with strategic AML CFT deficiencies in early 2020. However, notwithstanding these positives, it was observed that financial sector legislation and regulations were in need of updating to reflect current re realities and international best practices. Further, the FSAP also observed, assessed key risks, risks and vulnerabilities, which we would have also identified in our own financial stability reports, and which included rising household debt, sovereign concentration in the financial sector, regional interconnectedness, as Governor would have, have pointed out, 
platform, we have our banks have a significant market share in a number of Caribbean um, jurisdictions, over 30% in some instances. And our insurance companies, insurance companies are among the largest in Barbados, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and the Eastern Caribbean states. And in addition to that, there's environmental and climate risks. So in recent times, we have witnessed the devastating impact of Category 5 hurricanes. Um, we had Dorian in 2019 and um, Irma in 2017, and those had a de devastating impact in the region. And because of our interconnectedness, this, this is also a, a source of concern to us. Now we have to add pandemic risks to the, the financial stability risks that we are, we are facing. So given the onset of the global pandemic in early 2020, um, the FSAP thought it was, this was a material event. And while the, the assessment was initially concluded in February, it was thought that they had to do um, some COVID-19 stress tests of the banking system was necessary to determine its resilience. Stress tests assess the sensitivity of financial institutions' portfolios to extreme but plausible shocks. And it is a crucial macroprudential policy tool used to measure and assess financial stability risks. To put this in context, on the onset of the global pandemic in early March 2020, we would have seen where a lot of the banks would have extended deferred loan programs to persons who would have been adversely affected by the, the, the lockdown measures that were taken. And the central bank would have also facilitated this by extending regulatory forbearance in terms of um, the treatment of these deferred loan payments, such that, um, that institutions were urged not to see the deferred payments or treat the deferred payments as a, um, a significant increase in credit risk, for which um, additional provisions would be required under the accounting standards and our guidelines. So these would have necessarily had, these COVID-19 impacts would necessarily have some effect on the credit portfolios of financial institutions. So the FSAP assessed the resilience of the commercial banks by three illustrative stress scenarios, two COVID-19 scenarios and a pre-COVID-19 adverse scenario. For the pre-COVID-19 adverse scenario, the FSAP applied a combined shock, which included a significant drop in energy prices and a regional contagion impact. Upon application of this stress test, it was observed that no bank would breach the regulatory minimum capital requirement and that liquidity levels were adequate, but some tightness in foreign currency liquidity was, was evident. Under the COVID-19 central scenario, the FSAP applied the June 2020 World Economic Outlook Global Assumptions for Oil and Gas Prices and a sharp contraction in real GDP um, in the vicinity of, of 10%, given um, followed by a rebound of about 2 and 2.5% both in 2020 and 2021. And under this scenario, all banks remained resilient to shocks employed, but capital adequacy ratios take a discernible hit. Under the COVID-19 downside scenario, um, this was the a prolonged, a more prolonged recession was anticipated or tested. So instead of a rebound, the economy continues to contract in 2021 before um, experiencing some mild recovery in 2022. And under this scenario, a few banks would experience solvency challenges if sluggish economic position, um, conditions persist over the medium term. The um, top-down stress tests were also applied to the insurance industry, and these stress tests involved an economic shock and a natural catastrophe shock. Um, the, the insurance industri industry generally proved robust or resilient to these shocks. However, they were potentially vulnerable to consecutive and severe natural catastrophes. And under these scenarios, when applied, up to a third of regulatory capital could be consumed. Having regard to the assessed risk, some of the key FSAP recommendations to address the main fragilities in the financial sector were as follows. The independence, governance, and resources of supervisors, including assigning powers to issue regulations, need to be addressed. For example, in many countries, supervisors have the powers to issue 
um, prudential rules or regulations to ensure that emerging risks can be treated with in a timely manner. It was found that key prudential regulations took too long to be implemented under our current legislative framework, which can limit the ability of the central bank to be agile and responsive to risks as they, re as they emerge. The central bank should move swiftly to bolster the banking sector's res resilience um, by the introduction of the Basel II, Basel III regulations. And this includes um, promoting market discipline or improving market discipline by um, having disclosures on risk and risk exposure, exposures under the Basel III framework. The new insurance legislation needs to be um, implemented as quickly as possible to strengthen the supervisory regime. The span of consolidated supervision of financial conglomerates needs to be increased or expanded to ensure that all material financial entities in the group are adequately assessed. In the past, the focus really has been on the banking entities in the group, but we see financial conglomerates are spanning insurance securities, so that needs to be strengthened. The legislative framework for the regulation and supervision of credit unions is also deficient and in urgent need of reform, given the important role of these institutions for a large number of persons. In addition, the EFSA proffered broader recommendations that are focused on a more holistic development of the financial sector. And these pertain to articulation of a comprehensive national financial development strategy um, that will keep pace with global developments and shifts. And this strategy, strategy should focus on increasing access to finance for underserved segments, as well as improving the efficiency of financial intermediation. Um, the strategy, strategy should also entail a review and fleshing out of the role of the state in financial intermediation, particularly with development um, financing. And as Governor would have mentioned, there's no evidence that of private um, crowding out of private sector credit. However, the, the, this, this area needs to be fleshed out. Also, measures need to be advanced to promote the use of digital financial services to aid in efficient, safe, and widely accessible um, electronic financing transactions. And also an environmental risk assessment needs to be conducted to raise awareness of the impact of climate change and environmental risks on the financial sector. I will now stop at this point and hand you over to the inspector who will speak to you on our plans to address these issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. I am Patrick Solomon, the current Inspector of Financial Institutions. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Governor Hillier spoke about the current financial stability issues in Trinidad and Tobago. Deputy Inspector Michel Francis Pantor spoke to the highlights of the 2020 FSAP stress testing and the key recommendations to address legislative and supervisory framework. I will speak about the strategies being used and developed by the central bank to deal with the current and emerging financial stability issues. In May 2019, the central bank delivered a blueprint for continued financial stability in Trinidad and Tobago. However, given the level of uncertainty in our environment, our plans cannot remain static without continuous revision in this dynamic environment. The next few slides will focus on our supervisory priorities in our key risk areas. Our supervisory focus for banking will be on credit and liquidity risk. The central bank provided guidelines in order to ensure a robust credit and liquidity risk framework commence you with, with its size, complexity, and risk profile. Both guidelines detail the roles and responsibilities of the board and senior management and the central bank's expectation with respect to the management of credit and liquidity risk. 
with respect to assessing appropriate bank capital, capital levels allow institutions to have sufficient capital buffers to absorb financial and operational shocks and support growth and development, especially in period of distress. We are often guided by international best practice. Following the 2007-2008 financial crisis, the Basel Committee made recommendations regarding the quality and quantity of capital. The central bank therefore embarked on a reform project to update our framework. In May 2020, via legal notice 95, the financial institutions capital adequacy regulations were introduced resulting in a need for higher capital requirements. However, as a result of COVID-19, the central bank has deferred the implementation of some of the elements to allow licensees more flexibility and the ability to draw down on their high capital buffers during the pandemic. On the issue of strengthening governance in commercial banks, a revised corporate governance guidelines for bank was issued for consultation in June 2020. We are currently evaluating feedback and the guideline will be finalized in the short term. The revised guidelines reflect best practice and would facilitate greater interaction between the central bank and the commercial banks board and committee to assure strong governance and internal controls. The guideline also reflect emerging best corporate governance practices pertaining to strengthening of the financial institutions, risk governance, greater involvement in evaluating and prom promoting a strong risk culture and risk appetite will influence the overall risk management framework used in the organization. Advancing market conduct. A framework for supervision of market conduct practices in the financial sector is currently being established. The framework will see the central bank enhancing its regulatory oversight of the market conduct and empower the central bank to take action as needed. Insurance supervision. A modern insurance industry requires modern legislation for effective and efficient supervision. Once the Insurance Act of 2018 and its amendment of 2020 are proclaimed and fully implemented, it will contribute to a financially sound and stable industry and foster market discipline through its new requirements, in particular, the risk-based supervision that we intend to use. Currently, we use a compliance base. We are going to use risk-based and that will comply with what is done in the banking sector. The supervision of the insurance companies will be enhanced by the IAs supporting regulations and technical guidelines. Some of these include risk-based capital requirements, the Caribbean policy premium method for consistent valuation of life insurance liabilities across the sector, financial conditions report, which is equivalent to the stress testing, reinsurance guidelines, market conduct guidelines, and framework for insurers. Pensions. The central bank has sought to foster enhanced governance and communication practices within the private occupational pension plans through the issue of guidelines which encourage trustees, the management committees, and plan sponsors to develop and document operating procedures, adopt risk identification and mitigation strategies, and to increase the financial literacy of the pension members by keeping them regularly informed of the status of the plan's finances and the quantum of and any material changes to their benefit. With respect to the credit unions, the central bank is continuing its interface with the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development 
in sharing our perspective on supervision. The bank is committed to contributing to the national dialogue on an appropriate model for strengthening regulation and supervision in this area. The new e-money policy. The central bank recognizes that it must embrace digital financial services. And this has been articulated in our strategic plan. In addition, we need to collaborate and partner with various persons on the way forward for innovation to ensure safe and efficient and stable delivery. In light of the foregoing, the central bank developed an e-money policy in August 2020 in recognition of the development in the fintech space and the need for supervision and regulation of this emerging sector of the market. A fintech steering committee, including other agencies and regulators, was also established. An innovation hub and a regulatory sandbox will be set up shortly to facilitate information sharing, approval, monitoring, and testing. Essentially, the central, the innovation hub provides us with a central point of contact with the three regulators. It provides information and guidance on regulatory and operational requirements to offer fintech products and services. And it allows persons to submit applications for approval of fintech products and services. By on October the 2nd, tomorrow, we will be launching the Innovation Hub. So stay tuned for that. The Sandbox is a framework set up to allow small scale live testing of innovations by private firms in a control environment under regulatory supervision. All that I have said is that these plans require close collaboration with other financial institutions and regulators. The system is becoming larger, borderless, more complex and sophisticated and institutions are becoming increasingly interconnected. As such, we cannot supervise on a solo basis. All institutions, particularly systemically important financial institutions with cross-border operations must be supervised on a consolidated basis. This requires collaboration with other regulatory authorities to develop strategies to treat with the sharing of information and the harmonization of reporting and other supervisory requirement. This is being pursued through the establishment of MOUs, supervisory colleges, which facilitate meetings with the management of the financial institutions to discuss challenges and opportunities and to hear the views of other regulators. The establishment and refinement of stress testing framework, both top down and bottom up, which is essentially important in these times. The development of interconnectedness maps, as well as both for a domestic point of view, as well on a regional basis. We also get technical assistance from international bodies is being accessed to further strengthen regulation and supervision. We also have financial holding structures are all also being required to ring fence the financial and non-financial activities in the group, particularly as they become larger and more complex. This necessitates consolidated supervision as opposed to solo supervision which increases the need to manage home-host relationship. In this regard, the central bank also coordinates with regional bodies such as the Caribbean Group of Banking Supervisors, the Caribbean Association of Insurance Regulators, the Caribbean Actuarial Association, the Caribbean Association of Pension Supervisors. The central bank is also a party to a tripartite MOU with the Financial Intelligence Unit and the Trinidad and Tobago Securities Exchange Commission that was introduced in 2019 
which includes operational procedures for joint on-site examination. The information I shared with you today highlights the strategies and the projects undertaken to deal with current and emerging financial stability issues. In addition, tools and techniques used to develop people, processes, and systems will also discuss. In closing, in the words of Winston Churchill, I would like to say that no crisis should go to waste. Therefore, the lessons learned may be used as opportunities for the financial sector to emerge more resilient in the future. Thank you for your undivided attention. At this point in time, I would like to pass you back to Kevin, who will continue the proceedings this morning. Thanks, everyone. I thank you very much, Patrick, and also thank you, Governor and Michelle. I think we need to appreciate that as a country, we have been extremely fortunate to have an EPSAP at this time. Uh, if we look at what has happened since the pandemic, it has really helped us to shine a spotlight on some of our blind spots, which will enable us to strengthen our financial sector surveillance. So now we're going to move into our question and answer session. And again, to remind you, could you please use the raise hand icon? And when you acknowledge, kindly state your name and the organization which you represent. And also we, we are asking that, uh, at least in the first round, that you limit the number of questions to at, at most two, so you can have as much questions as possible. Good morning. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Anthony Wilson, who has a question. Anthony, please go ahead. Good morning. Is uh, everybody hearing me? Yes. Morning. Morning, Governor. Morning, Mr. Finch and Mr. Solomon and Mrs. Francis Panto. My name is Anthony Wilson. Um, I'm at the Trinidad Express. <clears throat> Um, in compliance with the regulations of the moderator, I would just like to ask this one question as an opening um, shot. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to a local insurance company, um, is the central bank keeping tabs on that company's uh, issuance of a bond in Jamaica? to fund the acquisition of an to part, partly fund partially fund the acquisition of an insurance company portfolios in Jamaica from uh, its parent company from the local insurance company's parent company any concerns or, or, or worries about interconnectedness and 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 um, uh, leverage and so on. Thank you, Anthony. We'll take a few more questions before we have the panelists respond. I'd now like to acknowledge Ms. Uh, Carla Bridgela. Carla, you can go ahead. Hi, good morning, everybody. How are you? Um, I am Carl Virgil. I am from the News Day. Uh, if possible, can the central bank, all um, three of the panelists, uh, give a comment on the proliferation of the SUSU type investment schemes and what does that say about the confidence of the people in the population uh, choosing these over, you know, perhaps more established ones from? financial institutions is it is it does it does, do you think that suggests among other things a lack of confidence in the ability of the financial system to give them what they um what they require i'm sure i'll have other questions later on thanks thank you very much carla 
And to close out the first round, I acknowledge Mr. Richard Young. Mr. Young, you can go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. I, I'm not too sure. I don't think I'm on camera, unfortunately, although you asked me to do so. Um, first of all, let me congratulate the Central Bank. This has been a really nice, very short, succinct presentation. It really gives a good synopsis. I was wondering how much of the plans that the bank has, how would that integrate with some of the plans of the recovery committee? Because I know many a times there's always, you know, I, I guess a recovery committee by nature would want to have people, particularly like the financial institution, uh, be a little more flexible, um, a little more liberal, and then you start getting the complaints about lack of credit and that kind of stuff. And whether the central bank has studied the report or they have in fact worked with you people to ensure that there's some harmony and collaboration. You got it? Yeah, thank Kevin? you, Mr. Young. So now we will ask the panelists to please respond. I think so now we can we could start with you uh, questions from Anthony and we can proceed up. Thank you. I guess I, I would defer that to um, the first question to to Patrick as it's in it's a clear supervisory area. So I could just talk generally and Patrick could talk more specifically. But certainly we do take into account everything, including companies' leverage, their plans, their whole business operations. While we would not be able to to clearly talk specifically about any uh, details of a of a specific company, we do take into account everything and we are um, appreciative of your concern, And but we are working on all aspects of, of supervision, including uh, leveraging and plans in that area. But I'll leave Patrick to, um, to weigh in on that. Let me just, as, a, as I'm on the floor, uh, talk about the, the SUSU uh, stuff, as, as certainly as, as I see it. I think, uh, how I would like to put it is that people who believe that they, they, sh they are investing in something that gives them a very high return in a very short period of time, so perhaps $5,000 and you get um, $25,000 in two days, I think you should ask yourself three questions. The first is, can I afford to lose this $5,000? Let's say it's $5,000. Well, you have to look at what your situation is. If you have $200,000, $5,000 is, well, you know, you could lose that because you have to be aware that if it's a, a highly um, profitable uh, investment, then it is likely to be highly risky. So you think about it. If it is that you have a lot of money and it doesn't affect you, think about it that way. If it means that next week, your child wouldn't have pampers, think again. The second point, or the second question you could ask yourself is that, how are they making this money? You put it into a company, they give you this fantastic return. Exactly what are they doing to, to come up with that? I think that is relevant because you look at your own circumstances and you say, well, 5,000, 10,000, how many maxi trips did I have to make at 45% at capacity too, to scrape up this money, this $5,000. How, um, how many people's stores did I have to, to, to paint or, or polish to make up this money? Or how, many, how much overtime did I have to clock at the docks to make up this money? And you see, wait a minute, I had to do a lot of work to gain this. Clearly, if it is just turning over this big return, something needs to be, you, are, you need to look at that. The third thing that I think people should do is, or, or ask themselves is, do I have any recourse? If something goes wrong, can I go to the central bank? Can I go to the Securities and Exchange Commission? Can I go to the um, Financial Services Ombudsman, which you could do with registered companies and so? Uh, does it have deposit insurance? You know, the banks have up to 125000 So I think once someone makes those decisions, we can't make decisions for them, 
ask your, yourself these questions squarely, then you would be in a better position to determine what you want to do. I must admit, and, and this is where the central bank always keeps its ears close to the ground, that some of the things seem surprising, that there would be so many people involved in potentially um, you know, very difficult schemes. But we live and we learn, and it does mean that we have to, to up our game in terms of financial um, education. So I've talked to our ombudsman and so forth, because we live, as I said, and we learn. Even when we did the demonetization exercise, we were really surprised to see how many people had $100 bills under their mattresses. We, we had a, a, a notion. So I think it does reflect, to some extent, uh, some people's anxiety for a certain quick gain, and it may reflect the fact that they, they may not be asking themselves some of these questions. But we will certainly be looking at, at what it means in general for our program of education. In terms of the question on the recovery committee, I think the central bank is poised to play its part in, in any um, solution for the economic situation in whatever way we are um, requested to do so or we, or we insert ourselves in, in processes. We have a lot of contacts. We have a strong research department. We have um, people that, that know their business in, in a lot of areas. So we are ready. We are poised. We have, um, as Patrick said, we have our engagement with the IFC, with a number of different organizations. We talked to the credit unions. We talked to a number of agencies. We talked to BP recently. So whatever role we could play, we are poised to play that. So I'll turn you over to Patrick in case he has something to ask to, ask, to um to add on the insurance question. All right, good morning. Good morning, everyone. To answer the question, yes, we are aware of the issue. And secondly, the issue is being monitored by a Caribbean regulator because that falls under the jurisdiction. As part of our consolidated supervision approach, we will inquire when we see certain activities taking place in the market. And our issue is, after the acquisition, the company that is acquiring must continue to be safe and sound. So at this point in time, this is the information that I could give you about this question that you asked. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. As we continue with the questions and answers, I see uh, Ms. Bridgelala, uh, she has another question. Carla, can you go ahead? Uh, and apologies also for the first uh, three questions. We had some camera delay, but it's just rectified, so you can proceed to turn on your cameras. Uh, Carla, you're, you're muted. Could you un unmute your microphone? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, hello again. Um, again to the panel, if you all could give some insight about now the Minister of Finance at the spotlight on the economy said devaluation is not an option at this time. Can you give a little more insight about um, the central bank's um, evaluation of the um, exchange rate system and if you all do agree with that um with that notion that uh devaluation shouldn't be an option at this time thanks well i i could jump in kevin uh okay, okay. No, oh, sorry no go, go ahead we have one yeah. more question but you can go ahead okay our position is as follows we do have a macroeconomic imbalance apparent for the last few years. So it is no secret that there is an imbalance in the foreign exchange market. It has been due in part to the um, collapse in energy prices. We had some production difficulties. The COVID didn't help. And so this is where we are. And we believe that what is really important for stability in each, each area and balance is an overall macroeconomic solution. I mean, you've heard me say that over and over. 
and it sounds um, repetitive, but it is what we truly believe, an appropriate combination of fiscal, monetary, and um, structural policy, in particular, structural meaning getting the way of doing business more agile, getting flexibility in different markets to be able to take advantage of different scenarios. So let me point to something that a study that, that the fund had done, the IMF had done a couple years ago, and they presented it in Trinidad and Tobago, and it really resonated, where they looked at the experience of, and this was pre-COVID, they looked at the experience of Latin American countries and the Caribbean with depreciation or sudden devaluations or whatever you want to call it. They found that what happened? In general, if the de depreciation was steep enough, then you had the balance of payments coming back in balance. Okay, so you say, well, maybe that is, that is good, but it's not the, the, the full story. What they also found is that for countries that didn't have flexibility in, in their operations, it came at the extent or came because of import compression. So there was a huge compression of imports as opposed to a boost to exports. So I think that is imperative to, to know. Contrast that to the case of, um, of Asia. When you have a small depreciation of their currency, wow, toys fly off the shelves. People start to produce more because their, their, their operations are quite flexible to take into account what may be a price, a price change. So I think we have to look at, at different aspects of, of how a depreciation may, may work. Having said that, in, in the case of the, or the central bank's view, it is not so important the exchange rate regime, but the complementary policies, because we do see, if I, I, I were to look at two extremes, one in which you have a fixed exchange rate and so fixed that you are in a currency union, like in the, in the Euro or the Eastern Caribbean, and two are very polar extreme where you have complete flexibility, right? Both situations and the hybrids in between could work, but it all depends on a number of things. Your flexibility to, to deal with situations, as well as the credibility, what it means, and the complementary policies. If you don't have that, then it would, any, any change, including any depreciation or, or whatever, would have a temporary um, and perhaps adverse uh, scenario. So I think ultimately the central bank, we are prepared to operate within different regimes, but for us, the more important thing is complementary policies that would make whatever solution you have really uh, durable. Uh, thank you, Governor. We have uh, two more questions, one from Mr. Wayne Das and Mr. Mitch B. Silver. However, before we, we go to them, uh, Mr. Young's question on the recovery would plan. Uh, can somebody address that, that question? Uh, Isha? Um, well, Governor, I just adding to what Governor would have said, with respect to the recovery work plan, in terms of engagement on the digital front, we would have had um, meetings with the IFC, which is the Trinidad Tobago International Financial Center, and our plans do dovetail um, based on the national recovery plan. So you would have had, if you look at that plan, it would mention the e-money policy, which um, was passed. Um, we also have the regulatory innovation hub that is going to be launched tomorrow, um, and then the this regulatory sandbox. So on the digital front, there there is alignment with respect to the national recovery and um, plan and and the strategic plans of the bank. In addition to which, we are looking at doing a holistic payment system legislation. So that is also on the cards, and that is expected to help on the payments side of an e-commerce side of the business. So I, I hope that helps, um, Richard. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we'll have Mr. Das followed by Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Das. OK, uh, um, good morning. Uh, good morning. Are you all hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. OK, good morning, uh, Governor. and to all your colleagues and thank you for the um, very, very clear and comprehensive presentation. Um, my question is on just to find out from the panel, uh, what's the current status 
of the new insurance act um, and also to find get a little insight into uh, where we are with the credit union legislation i know a few years ago a draft credit union bill was actually presented and you know there were several discussions really held on it and so on um, but i haven't heard um, any sort of updates on that i would say over the past year or two so just just uh, just looking for an update on those two pieces of um, legislation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Das. Uh, Mr. De Silva. Hi, Mr. De Silva. Uh, could you kindly unmute your mic and proceed? Okay, uh, I see we have an additional question from Mr. Wilson. So, Anthony, could you go, go ahead? Hello? Hey, Anthony, you're still muted. Can you put on your mic? It appears that uh, Anthony is having some some challenges. Hi, hello. Are you hearing me now? It's Mitch De Silva. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are you, you know Mitch? You can you can go ahead. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, I just I had a question um, as it relates to the economic bulletin and the point that is made there in relation to the need to coordinate fiscal and monetary policy. Um, and as as we as we know, we have a very accommodative monetary policy stance at the moment with um, looking just looking specifically at the liquidity levels in the system, which are heightened to say the least. Um, so I don't know if you can give more color on how that coordination is going to happen um, going forward, um, given as, as you state in the bulletin, the limited fiscal space that we have to align an accommodative monetary policy um, potentially. I, um, I, and, I, and you sort of spoke to some of the things before, I think Carla's question on devaluation and your response um, touched on it, as well as what uh, Mrs. Pan, Francis Panto spoke to on the ease of doing business. So just wanted to see if there's anything incremental you could add to that on that point in the bulletin. Thank you very much. I saw uh, Anthony coming back in. Anthony, are you still there? Okay, until uh, Anthony sorts out his issues, we'll ask the panel to respond. There are two questions from Mr. Das and from Mr. De Silva. Let me, let me start and I will leave, leave um, Patrick and company to talk about insurance. Thing. On the credit union side, uh, we are concerned about credit union supervision and regulation, as many people are. We think that something needs to be sorted out and it needs to be sorted out as quickly as possible. Now, we are just one player in, in a whole um, scenario that includes the credit unions themselves, the ministries, the relevant ministries, and the, the overall government administration. So we will be guided by that. We have been active in talking to the credit unions. We have been um, having seminars with them explaining to them our approach to, to supervision, sharing some of our, of our insights. We've had, as Michelle mentioned, or I think it was Patrick, um, technical assistance discussions with the Ministry of Labor now. And so that is ongoing. So we are poised to play any role that, that, um, that we are called upon to do. Our main uh, intention is that whatever solution is, is, uh, is found, the supervision must be robust and it must give comfort to the, the many 
people who invest their hard-earned savings in credit unions. So I cannot say where the legislation is at. I think that it is still at an, an early stage, um, but we are poised to play whatever role we can. Uh, with respect to the question on the coordination of fiscal and monetary policy, that is a general thing that we say um, for the most part. But in this specific case, as I mentioned before, our strong policy actions led to, to a huge increase in liquidity. And, and some may say, well, this is un uncomfortably high. But so far, inflation has not uh, taken off. The liquidity is just there. And as I mentioned, it has been somewhat stagnant because people may not be anxious to indebt themselves further, and the banks may also not be anxious to put out new loans in which they are concerned about credit quality. So we do have that situation. Now, with respect to the coordination of fiscal and monetary policy, more, more generally, we see this liquidity as potentially allowing borrowing by whoever, including the central government, we would, we would urge whatever borrowing to be carefully um, calibrated so that debt does not, does not blossom too, too rapidly because you have, you have to pay it back, and that you do not have crowding out of the private sector. What do I mean? If in certain situations the, the public sector is so dominant that it takes money that could be used by the private sector, then it's not something that is, is very sustainable because it could end up having problems later on. We have not seen this now. As I said, the, the suppression of credit, private sector credit, is really something on its own. But we have to look at that in the long term because as was mentioned, as I mentioned, and I think Michelle mentioned and Patrick, sovereign credit concentration is something we need to be, to be very much aware of. So we continue to, to work carefully with the fiscal authorities in understanding their financing needs because when we, we know, let's say there's government borrowing or there's, the government is, is planning to do some sort of thing, pay taxes, receive taxes or so, that affects the financial situation. It affects what happens with, with um, the liquidity and other variables. So we time our monetary policy actions, taking into account these, um, these factors but I, I don't want us to forget the other aspect of it, which is on the structural front, which we think is very important, because we do think that we do want to emphasize that our view is that there's a lot that could be done on the institutional front to improve things in Trinidad and Tobago, including on the data side, because some of the data is really um, tardy. We need to be in a mode where we have high frequency data on tap. I think we still need to get there and some institutional reforms need to go in those directions to, to improve how smoothly we can operate as a society and take advantage of things, including um, trading on our intellectual capital by, by having a, a strong database. So let me leave it there and, and um, you know, uh, there could be more discussion, I think, on the Insurance Act timing. Okay. What I could say about the Insurance Act is that we are, have gone through the process and we are near the finish line. And the finish line is proclamation. And this proclamation is to be effected by the president on the advice of cabinet. We understand that this is being actively co being considered by cabinet. So that's the latest that I have in terms of an update to the Insurance Act proclamation. However, we are ready. We are ready for implementation. We have done a number of surveys. We have prepared a number of forms and guidance so that whenever it is proclaimed, we will be ready for implementation. Thank you, Patrick. I see Anthony is, is back in, and we also have a question from Mr. Sulin Lala. Uh, Anthony. Can you go ahead? Susu question. A follow up on the Susu question and uh, another new one. Um, <clears throat> Governor, were you, are you suggesting that uh, 
some people who participate in these so-called susus are being less than prudent with their their income and with their um, their their wealth. And secondly, um, in that uh, in a related context, um, you spoke earlier about rising household debt. Um, <clears throat> That was with regard to the 2019 financial stability report. But can you answer the issue of uh, rising household debt in the context of the petrotrin closure, uh, COVID-19, and these various pyramid schemes that we've been hearing about? Hey, thank you, Anthony. Now we'll ask uh, Mr. Lala. Could you please go ahead? Yes, hi, good morning. Hi, Sonal Lala from uh, TTT News. Uh, Mr. Solomon, I think you would have spoken about uh, the new e-money policy um, that you spoke about in your presentation. Could you elaborate on this and could you tell us how does this affect the, the man on the street? I thank you, Mr. Lala. Uh, could we have a response to Anthony? Yes, th thanks, Anthony, for the follow up on, on the um, on the social question. And the answer is no. I'm not by any means saying that people were imprudent. What I'm saying is that people should ask themselves these three questions, and then they may decide how to go. So, for example, they may, have, may they may have ask themselves this question and say, well, okay, I still want to do it. It is up to them, but they would have been informed and now they have something that they may not have thought of. So these are personal decisions, but I think uh, we as a central bank or financial advisors could say, listen, take these things into account. You make your decision. Uh, you have your own situation that you know. Take these into account and you make your choice, but at least you are armed with this um, way of deciding. With respect to the, the rising household debt, I'm not sure how to answer that because we don't have recent data to say what household debt would be post petrotrin closure, post COVID-19. I could, however, um, surmise that household, household situation may have become much more difficult, certainly past COVID-19, because many households may be unable to work or have as much overtime or have their, their working hours may be, may be compromised. So to that extent now, they may find themselves being stretched to the extent that they have a base of high debt that makes their, their situation more fragile. And that is the point we are making with the rising household debt. Once you have a situation where your buffers are, are, are less, you have a lot of liabilities, when something happens, like COVID or so, then you become more exposed. It's similar to a government. If a government is doing well, but it has built up debt, when something happens, it could find itself in problems. So we need to be aware of that. So when people are thinking of indebting themselves more, please consider if something happens, what would you do? Now, I'm not trying to minimize the, the difficulty in a circumstance like this, because you could find a, a, a very um, tense situation where you may not have had a lot of household debt before, but you have all these things suddenly come on you. You have a death in the family, you have, um, you know, medical expenses. At the same time, you have, um, you know, you can't work five days a week and so. So you may have to get recourse to some short-term short -term borrowing. It's a difficult situation in which case you may have to, to try to get some way to get by. So it is not it is not very easy, but but um, the main point is that try in the good times when you have the, the option, don't indebt yourself unnecessarily, because it could be difficult to unwind it in 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 case of a problem. In the case of the petrochem closure, again, I don't know. I assume he meant for the particular workers that would be affected, and I think the general um, lesson would be the same to the extent that you see something coming up and you say, well, okay, will my job be on the line or so? Maybe I have to think 
how I'm, I'm operating because of my particular sector or so. Uh, so those are my short set, those two questions. And I'll leave um, either Michelle or Patrick to talk about the the e-money. Good morning, Mr. Lala. So I will try to answer your question. The new e-money policy, um, it will allow for persons other than banking institutions to issue e-money. So there will be categories of people who could apply, a telecom provider, a payment service provider. So they could apply to, to issue these the e-money. So in terms of the man in the street, it provides an alternative payment mechanism for, for persons. Now, in, um, the, the e-money policy allows for transactions of a different sizes, like if you have a wallet of a different size. So it, it goes from micro transactions to medium to larger value transactions. So the, similarly, the KYC requirements to be applied would be in keeping with the risk um, attached to the wallet size that you, you have and the types of transactions you would be doing. So it is seen as also a financial inclusion mechanism. So for persons who may not have been able to, to get a bank account, that um, um, they may be able to have an e-money account to facilitate e-payments, right? Once um, you wouldn't have that to, to meet that very, very high threshold or that higher threshold that, that banks may have for small transactions. So um, the KYC AML to be applied would be commensurate with the risk. Thank you, Michelle. I had indication that Mr. Young wanted to come back with a, another question. Mr. Young, are you there? Are we okay? You hearing me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Okay. So, you know what? 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 Am, you know, in my stage in life, pensions is a very important thing. And I noticed that in the report, reference was made to besides the credit unions, also the pension. And I guess by extension, it kind of dovetails with life insurance companies who generally are the ones. And then, of course, the self-administered plan. But, you know, in the scheme of things to the country, the national insurance scheme, which is obviously not supervised by the central bank, unfortunately, um, is a major player. And we all depend on it. So I was wondering whether in the financial assessment or even in looking at the financial stability of the financial system, do we factor in the NIB at all? Or is there coming together, sitting with perhaps the Minister of Finance, I guess, because they report to them, or even the NIB board, or the NIB, you know, to, to look at the overall things, you know, overall assessment of pension plans? Because, you know, we all know the big challenge is really investment material, right? And, and if we stick, you know, the 80-20 the 80 rule and, and we all enter the local investments and then the whole region where we are challenged. So, so that would be my kind of question about pension, is NIB included, that kind of stuff. Thank you, Richard. Patrick, this falls in, in your lap, I don't know if you wish to respond. During the debate of the Insurance Act of 2018, the question was asked about the pension and whether there is need for updated legislation in the pension arena. It was decided that that would be done as a separate item. Currently, what we actually supervise is the private pension plan. So we do not deal with the national pension plans. I think the view was that you had to look at the pension legislation from a holistic point of view. The other thing is that as part of our assessment, we have something which we call deem feeds. And the NIB is one of the institutions that we, we monitor. But we need to get empowering legislation 
in order to go further into the NIB. But you, as you recognize, the NIB is not purely a financial institution. It is a financial and a okay. social institution. So sometimes some of the prudential measures that we implement may not always be applicable in that situation. I share your thoughts because when we look at the size of the pension sector in this country, at least the private sector, it is larger than the insurance sector. So we have commercial banks being first, pensions being second, and the insurance being third. So yes, it is an important area, but that has to be a national discussion on how best to improve safety and soundness, how to get the necessary prudential rules and regulations to apply. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Uh, we have one more question, but before we go to Mr. De Silva, uh, Charles De Silva, not Mr. De Silva, uh, there's a comment from the member of the public who wants to know if the video will be available afterwards. And we can assure you that uh, the session will be available on the Central Bank's YouTube channel. So now we ask Mr. De Silva, that again, Charles De Silva, you can go ahead and ask a question. You can yeah, turn on your video if you like, Mr. De Silva. Um, hello, are you hearing me? We're hearing you. Um, okay, I, I can't figure out how to turn the video on. I'm not seeing the... <laughs> I'm not seeing the switch or whatever. Anyway, um, so you're hearing me, and and I guess yes, that we have to do for the moment. Um, my question, firstly, for the first part of the question is, um, and this is probably from uh, Michelle Panto. Um, are we considering the use of e-money for uh, international transactions? Um, or will it be strictly limited to internal transactions, domestic transactions? That's the first, the first part of the question. The second part is, um, I, I heard earlier on in the presentation, um, we, we talked about, about um, you know, certain risk factors and vulnerabilities, one of which was uh, the, the growing interconnectedness of, of, you know, within the region. And I was wondering, um, given you know the speed at which transactions can now take place, um, with the push towards you know digital modes of, of of doing business and so on, whether the 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 sort of collaborative mechanisms we have among our regional regulators, um, whether what we have is enough uh, to, to to deal with. The sort of instantaneous nature of 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 you know transactions and so on within the financial system, um, where mm -hmm. risk can materialize out of the blue virtually. Uh, I think I I think I heard uh, mention of things like you know regional for and um, MOUs and so on. But my question is, don't we need something a little bit more? more agile to deal with uh, the speed at which uh, risks and threats can emerge. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, okay, thank you, Charles. Um, I will take a, a stab at the first part of the question. Um, with respect to the e-money policy, the e-money policy at this point in time is focused on domestic transactions, not on international transactions. There are a number of laws um, that are in place. So in terms of the international remittance part of it, that will fall under the Exchange Control Act. And when we would have done our research and um, engage with other authorities that would have e-money, it was largely on the domestic front. And we felt at this time, we would want to start off on the domestic issue um, in terms of managing the risk of these transactions. As I mentioned, there is a wider project in terms of doing, um, looking at the national payments landscape, where currently our legislative framework governing payments is very fragmented, 
fragmented. So we are looking at it in, from a holistic viewpoint in terms of um, what is needed to promote a comprehensive piece of legislation that is needed to promote payments. And that will look at the whole cross-border aspect, things like looking at access and interop interoperability in, a, in a, a wider way, in a wider context. So, and that's on the cards. And the policy work on that has already commenced and is in train. Um, on the interconnected, interconnectedness side, I will, I will um, pass over to Governor on that. But in terms of on the payments issue, there is a work stream going on now between um, by the Financial Stability Board and the Committee of Payments and Market Infrastructures. And they are looking in, in a lot of detail on cross-border payments and what can be done in terms of, 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 of that, that aspect of payments in particular. And that involves even looking at our existing, increasing the efficiency of payments from the, um, other than the SWIFT mechanism, where we can look at our existing architecture and improve that architecture to facilitate payments on that side. And that whole work, um, a, part, a part of the work stream, it involves a lot of collaboration among the regulators. And I guess it will also include looking and reviewing the processes in place for, for um, collaboration, including the MOUs and what other mechanisms need to be put in place. And that, um, that work stream, the action plan is actually being finalized in that regard. So Governor, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, thanks. I think Michelle is being very modest in this thing you know, because she's at the heart and soul of a lot of the, the collaboration with the, um, with the region and elsewhere. So it is fairly well established, as Charlo said, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, those guys between Patrick, Michelle, and, and some other people in, in, in the, um, the supervision department and our legal team, they're always talking to, to the, the other regulators, always, because things come up very quickly and you have to make decisions. A lot of times, a lot of, you know, wheeling and dealing. Then we also meet on a regular basis, one-on-one -on -one with financial institutions who might have something coming up, but they don't want to blurt it out to the public. So we chat about it, we get an idea, we talk to other regulators. So I think to answer Charlo's question, the, um, the framework is well established. The personalities are engaging and they, they, they work well together. I think, do we need to do more, more, more of it? Clearly, we need to. We need to continue what we're doing and, and maybe even deepen it more and have it at other levels. In other words, it wouldn't be just Patrick and Michelle talking to the guys, which you have other people, but it becomes deep embedded in the, um, in the structures of the different organizations because you have you know, so much going on. So I think it is, it is well established. We have some, um, even some formal institutions, the Caribbean Group of Banking Supervisors, insurance regulators uh, and all of these things and, and we talk to each other on even sharing experiences so like recently um belize guyana um who was it i think the bahamas or somebody wanted to, to introduce deposit insurance so our deposit insurance we explained our situation our deposit insurance people went across there and helped them out so there's a lot of inter-regional collaboration sharing of experiences and, and, um, and this, this works a lot. Now, um, on, uh, let me just mention on the FinTech area and on something that is close to your heart on the research area, we, have, we, are, we are beefing up our um, research supervision, macro policy, um, debates and discussion in our Caribbean economic research team, which we are, and recently they did a, an, an excellent paper on FinTech and on e-money, moving to digital currencies, moving towards um, reducing cash, cash usage across the Caribbean. So a lot of this work is, is going on, and we, I think we just need to institutionalize it more and continue to do what we are doing because the stakes are, are getting higher, as you recognize, and the rapidity with which things are happening is even more, more intense. Thank you, Governor.
Uh, we are quickly approaching the end of the session. Um, we could perhaps take one or two more questions. Uh, I see Mr. Wilson and Mr. Lala's hands still up. I'm not sure if they want to come back. You perhaps just take one or two more questions. Hello? Anthony, yes, we're hearing you. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Governor, you mentioned uh, sovereign credit exposure. Um, and you were referring, I think, to uh, one third ratio with regard to exposures of um, to the gov government of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, in a context of continuing fiscal deficits, um, how do you expect the government to finance those deficits, uh, if not by partially borrowing from the, the local market? Well, yes. Is that the full question? Y yes, for now. Do you want more? To you. Yeah, so, so, so the, the question is, um, in the context of the concern about uh, sovereign credit exposure... No, no, sorry, I, I understand the question, but... If right, okay, good. More questions. No, one at a time. <laughs> All right, you like to tease us. All right. <laughs> I think it hit the nail on the head. The whole thing is really a macroeconomic issue that you should have fiscal consolidation at some point where when things settle down, the government's expenditure is not larger than its revenue. So this is where you want to go. Uh, because if you don't, then you have, it could spill over into macroeconomic difficulty. So that is the core of the matter. The financing is then comes into play. Because clearly, if you have a large deficit or a sizable deficit, then you have to finance it some way. The three basic sources of finance are internally from the banking system, the internally, well, I'll, I'll put four, internally from the banking system, internally from the central bank, then you have externally, or then you could have a fourth thing, you liquidate assets or, or whatever. Ideally, it, unless you have assets to liquidate, and which could, which could be an, an option, but you have to take into account other issues, then you would try to, to minimize the, certainly not borrowing from the central bank. We wouldn't advocate that because of the inflationary consequences. So you are left with a combination of internal and external. So you could choose. The external clearly means that you would get the foreign currency in the short run, but of course you have to repay it. So you have to take that into account. The domestic side, you need to get it from someplace. And the situation is such that, that really you don't have much of, of an option. The commercial banks, the, the other institutions say, well, the government um, you know, paper is the best in town. So you, you're stuck with, 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 with it being financed domestically. What we are advocating is that you take the long-term perspective and say, if this continues, for a very long time, you could have more and more concentration in one area, and that is not healthy. So, but to get back to the, to the core of it, the real issue is on the fiscal balance situation. And hopefully over time, you will be able to reach a situation where you have fiscal balance or surpluses so that you don't have to increase debt, whether domestic or foreign, and therefore borrow from the banking system or, or um, elsewhere. Okay, thank you. And before we close, we have to take one question from the public, if you will indulge us. We have a question from Mr. Ulrich Miller. And the question is, how does CBTT see the impact of digitization on employment? Michelle, you want to take that or? or? 
I don't think we had really thought about it from an employment perspective, but I think um, I think it would be it will create new avenues in terms of of fintechs entering the space. So it's an it's an alternative it's an alternative um, to what we already have. So uh, I, I I'm not sure what the the impact will be eventually because it's it's new. We would have persons who expressed you know um in terms of a, a technology a fintech company you don't need um a lot of people operating fintech and that is what we would have seen that you, you don't need a, a, a large workforce you could be a fintech company operating out of your home so i cannot see at this point what the the impact on technology would be on on employment would be but it, it's 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 certainly it we will have to wait and see but we would have known that um, prior to the e-money policy being um, order being made, there were a number of persons expressing interest, and um, we we now that the order is made that we we do see people knocking on the door. But in terms of quantum, I cannot see at this point. Thank you. If, if I'm to if I'm to just um, complement what what Michelle is saying, I think. In the long term, we are looking at it, or even in the medium term or short term, as really an efficiency issue. We are behind the curve in a lot of things, and, and we use a lot of cash. As I said, the demonetization showed up that, and even now you, you see there's a, a high usage of cash. Too much usage could, could spell inefficiency. You could do things potentially quicker, easier, and safer by using electronic transactions once you have the apparatus. So it will not be, as Michelle said, a one-to-one -one thing that you, I, you introduce digitization and either some people lose their jobs because of it, you have less tellers or something, or they gain the job because of their inner firm. But to the extent that the, 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 um, the economy becomes more and more efficient, then you can play in a higher league because now we're playing you know, in the basics. But if people realize that, oh, you could come to Trinidad and Tobago, you could, you could do things quickly, you could do it online from wherever you are, you could pay your taxes, you could get your approvals for businesses, you could transact, you know, land transactions, everything very rapidly and quickly, and you could, you could enter into binding contracts with your suppliers and, and your customers. The world opens up. So being more efficient, people will gravitate towards you. And over time, you, you, you get better comparative advantage, and then that would naturally spill over into, into income and more people being employed. It would not be direct one-to-one -one or even necessarily in that industry per se, but as the economy becomes more efficient, and this is a big pillar of it, then you are able to, to export more, to do more, and to be more attractive, and hence to, to create more opportunities for businesses and for employment. Right, thank you, Governor. Uh, this morning we had a, a steady stream of questions. So we want to thank all our participants for engaging us this, this morning. Unfortunately, the time has, has been spent. Uh, before you leave, we would ask you, could you kindly fill out uh, a survey at the end of the webinar that will give us the feedback in terms of how you, you thought things went to be. So we thank you. On behalf of the panelists, Governor Hilaire, Mrs. Panto, Mrs. Francis Panto, and Mr. Solomon, we thank you again for joining the Central Bank today for this discussion, and we hope to see you in future CBTT events. Have a good day, everyone.